Operation Pedro Pan was a U.S. government program that brought more than 14,000 unaccompanied Cuban children to the United States, granting them visa waivers and paths to U.S. citizenship. The program, started in 1960, was halted two years later in the wake of the U.S.-Cuban Missile Crisis. Coming up next, the National Museum of American History hosts a roundtable discussion on the legacy of Operation Pedro Pan. The panel features Operation Pedro Pan participants and human rights scholars. This is an hour and a half. Thank you so very much, Faith. And thanks to the Smithsonian Latino uh, Center. Thanks for uh, having us here tonight. Thank you to the American Museum of American History. Uh, and the National Museum of American History for hosting us. We're delighted that, that you joined us. Uh, we're excited about tonight's panel, uh, and we're going to hear some incredible stories, we hope. Uh, before we start, I also want to share with you that in addition to being webcast uh, on the Smithsonian uh, Channel, uh, the event tonight is being recorded for future use on C-SPAN. So tune in, uh, look at your TV guide in the future, and see when the program will be airing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, some 50 years ago, 14,000 unaccompanied Cuban children were brought into the United States through a U.S. government program, an intensely controversial undertaking, Operation Pedro Pan, shattered families and created enormous hardships in the lives of the Pedro Pan children that forged their new existence in the United States. Children of various ages were separated from parents for months or years, and some would never see their parents again. They struggled with learning a new language, understanding a new culture, and a foreign way of life. But many adapted to their new surroundings, took advantage of their new adventures and opportunities made possible by their parents' agonizing decision to part with their children. And this evening, we have a panel of scholars and activists with us that will share incredible insights into Operation Pedro Pan. Uh, first of all, we have Emilio Cueto and Eloisa Echazaba. Both have incredible stories to share about the adversity that they have faced and the challenges they have overcome. Emilio left Cuba in April of 1961 at the advanced age of 17, and he continued under Pedro Pan until the age of 19. Eloisa arrived in the United States with her younger sister in September of 1961 and spent nine months uh, under the care of Pedro Pan. Also with us this evening are scholars Maria de Los Angeles Torres and Jacqueline Bava. Uh, Maria is the author of The Lost Apple, Operation Pedro Pan, Cuban Children in the U.S. and the Promise of a Better Future, and she currently serves as Director and Professor of Latin America and Latino Studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, Jacqueline is not a Pedro Pan. She's in fact born in India and raised in Italy. Uh, she is the director of Harvard University's human rights program and has published extensively on issues of migration, uh, refugee protection, children's rights, and citizenship, including co-authoring three reports entitled Seeking Asylum Alone that addresses unaccompanied and separated child asylum seekers. Nena, you are a Pedro Pan. Uh, you were sent out of Cuba by your parents at age six, and you've also studied this incredible event and written extensively about it. I'd love for you to start off tonight by kind of putting the history of that movement into perspective and maybe telling us the framework of Pedro Pan, please. Well, um, as Pedro Pans, I, I know there's a lot of them in the audience here, I always say there's um, as many stories as there are Pedro Pans. And, um, and I think that that is true. As we talk about the stories, um, they unfold in very particular families with all sorts of um, very specific stories. But there is a broader framework. And that framework has to do with the Cuban Revolution and the, um, the attempts by the United States to um, overthrow that revolution. And, um, I, from the research I've done, the origins of the Pedro Pan, I like to think about it in three stages, okay? And I'm not going to go into all the details here, but um, we're, we're talking about 1960 to 1965. 
very contentious years. Uh, it is the Cold War, it's the October Missile Crisis, Bay of Pigs invasion, um, three American presidents, okay? Um, so they're very charged times. And the first stage is when the United States decides that they want to overthrow the, the uh, Castro regime. And they authorized military plans. Part of those military plans included the evacuation of children whose parents were fighting in the underground. So the initial program was going to be for 200 kids. The parents were afraid that if they were caught or if they were put up to a firing squad, what would happen to their children. There were also young men who were involved in this who were facing firing squads. Um, after Bay of Pigs, the, that program ends. And the people who had been asked to take care of the kids, Father Walsh and the Catholic uh, Church and others denominations, um, say, think that it's over. But at that time, repression in Cuba is increasing. And at the same time, the pressure on the part of the United States on the Cuban government is also increasing. And people have no way to get out of Cuba. Um, there are visa waiver programs for adults and for families, uh, but there's also a, uh, the visa waiver program that was put in place for children becomes the quickest way to leave. And from 19, um, from Bay of Pigs to the October Missile Crisis, the bulk of the children leave. Um, the October Missile Crisis, at that point, there's 8,000 children that have not been reunited with their families because children would claim their parents. We needed security checks and children did not. Uh, but in, in 1962, both governments effectively shut the doors. And there's 8,000 children that Cuba does not let return, and the United States does not permit the parents to come in. So that goes until 1965, when the Cuban government placed the immigration trump card in Camarioca, and supposedly at that point, it's over. So that's the framework. What mechanism was used to get the children out of Cuba? Well, I think there were, there were many, but it's precisely a visa waiver, if you can think about this in the context of the Cold War, where the State Department gives a um, priest the authority to waive visa for children, which is sort of extraordinary. Uh, but there were many groups within Cuba initially. Uh, Jim Baker and Chris Baker, his son is here in the audience with us, was the director of a, uh, of a very progressive American school in Havana. They had fought against Batista, and then when democracy didn't come, they started fighting against the Castro regime. And at that point, he um, is helpful in trying to get the kids out. When they're arrested, when his group is arrested and they have to leave, it's the Catholic Church that steps in with other uh, opposition groups. But mainly, it was the women in those opposition groups uh, that um, sort of took care of getting the visa waivers out to the kids. Then who involved the Catholic Church in this operation? Well, we know for sure it was the State Department because that Father Walsh has told us. At the time, there was multi-agencies that were involved uh, in the Cuba project. And if we think about the origins of the program being the war against the Castro regime, there were multiple agencies, Defense Department, U.S. Information Agency, the CIA, the State Department, all of them were involved in this. What, what happened to most of the children when they came over? Maybe you can tell us first about your personal experience, but what, what have you heard about what the majority of children went through well, I when think, they first landed in Miami? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that I'd like for the Pedro Pons oh, to will. talk about that because, um, again, I think the stories are very different. Um, and there, we don't really know. I mean, there are, um, we know of many of the successful stories. Uh, we don't know of many others who, who perhaps did not have the success in um, some of the children ended up under the care of the Catholic Church going to holding camps and then being placed throughout the United States. It was a time where uh, child welfare agencies had decided that orphanages were not good and so they were placing out orphans that were in orphanages to foster homes. So there were these huge gigantic orphanages throughout. Many children ended up in those, others ended up with foster care. And the experiences are from very loving families to horrible, you know, sexual abuses. So. Jackie, you are a renowned expert on unaccompanied minors being separated from their parents in different situations. What can you tell us about your feelings regarding what the Pedro Pan children must have gone through back during that period? 
I think that um, there's some similarities or commonalities with all these separations where the children actually travel unaccompanied or separated, in other words they travel with other with other people but not their own immediate family. I think um, there's always certain elements of loss and trauma and terror actually that children experience but as Nina says there's a whole spectrum then of reactions. Some children are resilient maybe because of the family circumstances they come from, maybe because of their own individual personality and they survive and they make the best of it and they go on to have a productive and, and healthy life and others uh, have great difficulty overcoming the sense of loss. I know that in my own research, um, having done interviews with unaccompanied Chinese uh, children smuggled into the States and to New York, um, you get the same range of, of, of different responses. Some children who are really still struggling with why their parents ever let them go or sent them in the first place and, and desperately homesick and others who are determined to be successful and determined to integrate and to make the most of the opportunities. So I think there are many different reactions but I think it's fair to say that one can assume that all the children will have had moments of great terror and anxiety as they encountered this unknown world uh, away from the parents who cared for them initially. Sure. Uh, I'd like, first of all, I'd like to add my thanks to the Smithsonian Institution for giving us this opportunity. I'd like to go back to the beginning of the program. Uh, yes, it was created by the United States government because they were the ones the State Department had to allow and give Monsignor Walsh the permission to sign the visa waivers. But um, actually, it started with the parents in Cuba because they were the ones that first came to uh, Jim Baker, the uh, headmaster of Ruston Academy, and said, we need to get the children out of Cuba. Uh, you know, most, some of them were in the counter-revolutionary movement, and they were afraid that they would, if they would go to jail, what would happen to their children? So they wanted to get the children out. The ones that were not in the counter-revolutionary counter movement uh, saw uh, the repression that was beginning to take place in Cuba, okay? The main reason my parents wanted to get me out of there was because they saw how they were losing the ability to say how we were going to be educated and how we were going to be brought up. Now, some parents had already started sending the children alone to friends, to distant relatives, and a lot of the Cubans had already started uh, uh, leaving the island to go to Miami. The Catholic Church re realized this. I mean, they even saw children that we're going from one home to another home, and decided that they had to do something about it. They went to the uh, United States government and said, you know, we need funds to take care of, of, of these children and these Cubans that are coming. The United States government sent representatives to Cuba, to Miami, to study the situation, and that's how they provided the funds, and that's how the visa waiver uh, program started. Uh, but the program started in Cuba, with the parents wanting to get the children out because they wanted to get them out of the communist environment. They already were seeing that this was coming. There was already, they were already seeing the repression. Catholic schools, uh, between 1959 and 1961, when we came, my sister and I came, our schools that were Catholic had been closed. They were taken over by the government. Other, all of the other Catholic schools had been closed and taken over by the government. All the other private schools that were non-religious had been taken over by the government. So we had no school to go to. I was present in the school, in my school, when the militia took over. This was in 1961. I saw them coming in, going in and out of all the rooms, and that was the last day that we went to school because our parents didn't send us anymore. So they began you know, and they thought that the communist government was not going to last long. They never thought that it was going to last long. So they wanted to get us out of there for the months. We could not go to school. We were like locked up in the house. And if anybody found out, anybody in the government found out that we were not being sent to the government schools, who knows what would have happened to my parents? Because it had been happening. They would come, that would take you away. So I would say that it started in Cuba with the parents the United States government, the Catholic Church in Miami, reacted to that 
And maybe uh, the United States government thought that, you know, it was a good idea to do it, you know, to help overthrow Castro, whatever. But I think it was a win-win situation. If they did it for their own good, I mean, countries make decisions not based on altruistic reasons. They make decisions based on national security, politics, economics. If they did it for their own reasons, they helped us. They helped the parents in Cuba. So it was a win-win situation. But I don't want to make it sound like, for example, and another subject, we can talk about it later. All of our lives were not shattered. Uh, we were young. Children are flexible, are resilient. We went through hardships like we would have gone through them in Cuba. Of course, we were in our own country. But if you ask most of the 14,048 Pedro Pans who are grown up like we are now, if they're happy, if their parents sent them away alone to the United States in the Pedro Pan program, they, most of them, I would say 99%, maybe 95, whatever, will say that they were happy. Yeah. No, no, I don't think I don't, I don't agree. I we, you and I have had many discussions yeah. about this very same right. subject. I don't think you totally share that opinion, right. and right. you were kind of bitter for a while about uh, yeah. being sent over. You want to talk about well, that? Well, I mean, I don't know if bitter is the word. I, I think that um, I think our experiences are very different. I would never put a 99%. I think that um, there, in fact, in many of the conferences, every time we talked about this, uh, there, it's mixed. Would you send your children? And people who have children have thought about that a lot. And, the, and the dis sometimes it's yes and sometimes it's no, depending on the circumstances. I think there is a very important question we need to ask of policy. I think most parents of Pedro Pons, given a choice to come with their children, would have come with their children. And that's my contention, that this was a policy that went, it, it grew for many reasons, including the United States, including circumstances in Cuba, including personal circumstances in families, a kind of mushroom in a way that there were other visa waiver programs where entire families were coming. Why one only for children? And that's, that's a policy question. If the family was in danger, if the children and families were in danger, why not create a mechanism that allows parents to come with children? So I think that's more the perspective that I take away from this because it was a decision that was made and it was a political decision. And to that extent, um, and, and, and this is not to minimize the, the, the issues that parents were going through, the fear that they had, the real fears that they had, the humanitarian perspectives that the children, that people taking the care of the children, even Monsignor Walsh later on in life when the Guantanamo children, remember they were detained in Guantanamo, a couple of politicians in our community started saying, bring the children out like Pedro Pan. Monsignor wrote a letter saying, we have learned where possible we should never separate children from parents. Because immigration in particular is very, very fragile. And what happens today may not be here tomorrow. You let the children in thinking the parents are coming in two days, something happens in government, I don't know, 9-11, Monica Lewinsky, whatever, and the policy changes. So um, I think that's the I have the something short to add, and I, 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 I promise I don't mean yeah. to take everybody yeah. else's time. Uh, okay. But just one, something short. In the first two years, between 1959 and 1961, I came in September of, 60, September of 61. I think a lot of the parents during those uh, first uh, couple of years were not ready to leave Cuba yet, mainly because they thought that the communist government was not going to last. They didn't want to leave right away because they had elderly parents that they didn't want to leave behind, because they had businesses that they didn't want to just get up and leave them, uh, because they were, they, they were hoping, they were pretty sure that the children would come back you know, once the whole thing would blow over. So I would say that a lot of the parents even if they were given the opportunity of a visa waiver to come with the children or to come you know, uh, later, soon, would have preferred to wait. That's my opinion, and that's what I have discussed with other federal funds, especially the first two years. 
Emilio, you had a uh, unique experience because, as you were telling me earlier, you think you were one of the oldest uh, mm -hmm. Pedro Pan children to leave. You were 17? I was 17. A high school student or a graduate of high school? I had already graduated from high graduated. school. Graduated. I so think that came. makes me the one, the, the, the only one, or one of the few Pedro Pans who came from Cuba with a high school degree. So, which, quite unlike Nena, who was six years old, just barely started school, you had finished your, your education. So you had a different perspective on this whole thing. Tell me, I, I asked you if you were afraid, and you said absolutely not. Well, first of all, I, because I was 17, I was more involved in the decision of coming to the US than, than younger children. So it was, it was a more of a shared um, strategy in my case. I do agree with um, Eloisa. I think that one of the key contexts to understand the Pedro Pan operation is that parents thought of it as a parking lot. It would be a place to keep the, the children safe for a little while, only a little while, while things in Cuba would clear up. Because of past history of Cuba, the presence of the US loomed very large in the politics of Cuba. And uh, the United States had intervened in the past in Cuba whenever trouble um, was in the making, especially if it affected U.S. interests. So my feeling and my recollection at the times is that people thought that the U.S. would not allow a communist country 90 miles away from the shores of the U.S. And as a result, it was only a, for the parents, it was a question of what do you do with these children before the apocalypse comes around and the American planes start landing here. Um, they did not land but a, an invasion force trained by the Americans did land on April 17th. So clearly the thought of many Cubans, some wanting it, some fearing it, did materialize in some fashion. And I think parents were worried um, what to do with the children. I also agree with Eloisa that many parents were not ready f uh, to leave Cuba for many reasons. One of them is that they themselves had parents, which, they, I mean, they couldn't leave their parents behind. I mean, I met many people in that situation as I was, as I was growing up. And thirdly, I also agree with Eloisa that um, parents were concerned that their parental rights, which in Cuba it was a phrase that went back and forth, la patria potestad, which are a set of parental rights that, that parents have um, to design and determine the future of their children will be curtailed. A lot has been written about the patria potestad, and uh, my take on it is this. The same way that in landlord-tenant law, there's something called constructive eviction, whereas the landlord doesn't really throw you out, but creates the conditions uh, such that you have no choice but to leave, I would think, I would, I would argue that the laws of Cuba were such and the way Cuba was heading was to a constructive loss for the parents of their parental rights. Um, parental rights mostly dealing with education, dealing with where to live and how to travel. And in fact, I would argue that very soon in the early history of the revolution, parents lost those rights over their children. Parents lost the right to educate the children in private schools because they were confiscated on June 4th of 1961. Parents lost the right to send the children abroad because of all the laws of Cuba. And parents lost the right to move wherever. So even though the government did not take away the patria potestà of the parents, they effectively uh, took away m most of the decision-making powers of parents. So I, I do think that, th that that is the context. In my case, um, I um, left, I, I was, my family wanted me to leave Cuba, and I was planning to go to Spain, <coughs> and then I visited, I was going to try to get the visa to go to Spain, and the priest I was contacting was in spiritual retreat, and I couldn't reach him. So thinking, you know, who could help me, I went to see a lady who was the head of a, a very important Spanish institution, Hijas de Galicia, who was a fraternal 
a group of uh, daughters of um, descendants of Spaniards from Galicia province, who was a mother of one of my classmates. And I remember um, she was crying the day I arrived because the two children had left. She herself had parents who couldn't move, so, and I asked her to get me my visa, if she could help me getting the Spanish visa. And she said, well, why do you want to go to Spain? In any way, so she said, but you cannot go to a little aldea in Spain, and what are you going to do there? Where are you going to study? So she said, you promise not to ask any questions, I can get you to the US. And I just, of course, I said, well, how does it work? She said, it's okay, bring me your passport, um, and I'll take care of it. And the next thing, that was in January, I remember it was in January because I was going to be 17 in February, and I remember her telling me that it had to be before I would be 17. And then on April 14th um, uh, of 1961, which was a momentous day because that day was a um, fire in the main um, department store of Cuba, sabotage of El Encanto. I remember coming from the university home and being told by my mother that a priest, a Jesuit priest, who was a friend of mine, had called. And I mean, he was a friend, but he usually didn't call my house. So I went to his house and he said, here's your passport. Um, you have a visa to go to Jamaica, but you're not going to Jamaica. The plane is going to Jamaica after he drops you in Miami. When you arrive in Miami, you say, I am whatever, I forgot the code, and that's it. So that was April 14th, and my plane was scheduled for April 17th. Well, lo and behold, April 15th came, the invasion started um, um, sort of moving around, and on April 17th, Invasion came, airport closed, and I finally left on April 26th. So um, when I arrived, there were two social workers at the airport, an American and a Puerto Rican, so that she would be fluent in Spanish and handling the conversation. I was the only, um, of the only one of the Pedro Pan group, and I was sent to a place called Kendall, where um, the Ursuline nuns were taking care of the girls, and a Cuban family named Pruna were taking care of the boys. Emilio, that was 1961. April 27th. Tell us when you 26th. were able to go back to Cuba and maybe see your parents. Well, in my case, unlike other cases, um, my family, my mother never left. She had other problems, my sister. I mean, many things complicate departure. Then after 62, the uh, airport closed. And then my mother got ill, and finally she never left. And in 1973, my mother was, uh, suffered a thrombosis, and she almost died on that day of July of 73. And on that day, I started a long-term campaign, um, turned out to be long-term, to try to go back to Cuba and see my mother before she died. It took me four years and four months before the Cuban government would give me a visa and they just didn't give it to me. I had to extract it from them by all sorts of letter writing campaign, um, a campaign almost to threaten with a hunger strike. I was living in France at the time. I mobilized the entire French parliament and intellectuals. I mean, it was a four-year ordeal. So eventually, 16 years after my departure from Cuba, I returned and I saw my mother. She was by the time paralyzed and blind, but... Uh, It certainly was the, the most moving experience of my life. Yeah. Thank you. Nina, did there come a time um, when you decided you wanted to sit down with your parents and have a heart-to-heart -heart about what was their thinking? Why did they do this to you? And it, you tried to extract to them and try to understand their reasoning? Absolutely. When I, I actually started my research thinking that I wanted to talk to parents first, including starting with my parents. And, um, you know, maybe it's because of the way that we were raised or, I mean, my parents were also involved in, uh, in, in, in the anti-Batista struggle and then became very involved in the anti-Castro struggle. Uh, my uncle, um, you know, was um, in the underground uh, and so there were fears that we needed to get out. Um, they, in my case, 
it was the entire family that was trying to get out. And it was my uncle's entire family that was trying to get out. And they could not get a visa anywhere. I mean, they, as, as a family, there was no visa waivers for them. Uh, this became the, the vehicle, in a certain sense, for them to be able to get out. They sent me out, and then I would claim them. Okay, it's, I know this is sometimes harsh to talk about it because I guess from an academic point of view, we call these, you know, in the literature, they're called anchor babies, you know? And um, it is a mechanism that, you know, children come and then you bring your parents. And that's exactly what happened in my case. Um, I, I think, interestingly enough, I think my parents would have also um, had, had thought of wanting to come to the United States. I mean, my father was a doctor. Uh, we were not, you know, uh, high class. Um, it, he had studied in a government uh, scholarship. Um, they called them widow scholarships uh, under the Batista regime. Uh, and so the, his possibilities were not as great in Cuba at the time. And so they had thought of coming to the United States. My mother was very, very close to all her relatives. And I have aunts who stayed in Cuba who were very, very Catholic, uh, because they always said in this, you have to say this in Spanish, que no se la había perdido nada en los Estados Unidos, um, that they lost nothing in the United States. Um, although they lived, you know, um, very modestly and, uh, and with fear throughout those years, but they didn't want to come. So we've had family all over the political spectrum. Um, but in their case, I think it was, this became the, the way that they felt that they could leave. Jackie, this exodus is, is unique, but is it unique in the annals of, of, of exodus such as this, of unaccompanied children? Uh, what makes this one so special? I think what's unique about it is the scale and the concentration in a short space of time. So there was a very clear political strategy and I think that is unusual. Of course, as you say, children leave either because they're sent by their parents or because their parents have perished or because they decide to leave all the time. And even as we speak now, there are between eight and 10,000 unaccompanied uh, children in the U.S. who are in government custody, so to speak. So, and many of them actually not as fortunate as those who went to loving foster families. Many of them are in forms of shelter, which is really euphemism, a euphemism for detention. So, yes, unaccompanied child migration continues, but it isn't typically as organized or on the same scale. I think that there are many commonalities, though, as Nina was saying, you know, this question of, I mean, the tension between the agonizing decision that parents make about whether to send a child with the hope that you're going to reunify or whether to send the child as a sort of parking lot, you know, to get them out of danger or whether to get a child themselves to make the decision, which sometimes happens with older children. All those strategies still exist. So if you think today, for example, or in the recent past, um, many Afghani parents sent their boys a away just to make sure they weren't recruited by the Taliban. I mean, thousands of, of, of Afghan boys showed up in countries they'd never even heard of, like Australia, just to get out. Um, and today we're seeing this, you know, children who are leaving the Middle East, some of them drowning in the Mediterranean just in order to be safe. So these dynamics continue to happen, um, but not in the same concerted pattern, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you only were separated from your folks a couple of uh, nine months. months. Right, just nine months. I was lucky in that sense. Yeah. But um, what I would like to uh, mention is that I did not mean to lessen the the um, the unhappiness and and the and the uneasy situations that we Pedro Pans had to go through, some more than others. And even though I say that I'm super glad that my parents sent me away from the youth groups uh, that were being indoctrinated through the all the repression that was going through. Um, I really wasn't happy during those nine months. Uh, to illustrate, when I got back and I reunited with my parents in Miami, I told my parents, please don't ask me any questions. I don't want to talk about the previous nine months. And I took the photographs that I had and I tore them away, I tore them apart. Now I, I hope, I wish that I hadn't done it. But, uh, and I, I 
you know, in the, in the orphanage where I stayed, it was okay. It was difficult to get used to it because, you know, we're living with a, a bunch of strange people. Then in the foster home, I was living with a decent, nice family, but I wasn't happy because the only daughter that they had, for example, just to give you examples, was one year younger than I, and she was always in competition with my sister and I for, for grades, for friends, and, you know, and it was just an uneasy, unhappy situations. And uh, I think I'm in the middle, you know, some had it worse, some had it a lot better. For example, take Senator Mel Martinez, you know, he went to stay with a, a, a family that I think he was the only child in that family, the family didn't have any children, and he became like their own child. So I would say that was one of the best case scenarios. There were the worst, I was in the middle. And I still say that I'm very happy that my parents did it when they did it. And I'm very thankful to the United States government and to the Catholic Church for having provided the means for this to have happened. Uh, another thing is I don't have children, but I have little cousins and I, you know, I'm very close to children of, of friends. And if I'm asked the question, would you send children away now? I really can't answer it because I'm not in the situation that my parents were at the time. You could never tell unless you were in their shoes. That's right. So, Emilio, uh, Eloisa talked about tearing up some photographs that uh, had bad memories. You told me about tearing up some letters. Can you relate that story to it? Yes, well, actually, it, it, I think it's for a different reason, but maybe not. Um, when I returned to Cuba, I, unlike other people who, who only have seen a shell and another family living there, I went to see my family. So I entered my own home. And it was, of course, a, an incredible experience because my mother, who had, uh, of course, cherished that day and hoped for that day, had kept my room the way it was when I left. So it was a shocking experience to open you know, the closet and see my school clothes hanging there as if I would go to the school the next day, school that had been confiscated in the last 16 years. And my, you know, so, you know, all my letters, so I decided, I mean, I was so shocked to see, you know, that the shrine she, she had there. So I, so I took all my letters, I regret it today because it would have been a source of my own thinking of at the time, but I, 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 you know, tore them apart and I said, forget it. I mean, now I'm here, it's, you know, we've reunited, uh, you know, the past is the past, so there's no reason to keep these letters anymore. And I'm sorry because it would have been, first of all, it would have, it would have documented my own thoughts um, all the time, although I have a good memory and I, and as I left at age 17, my, my Pedro Pan experience is very clear in my mind as to dates and everything that happened, because I was older and of course this, this marked my life. I would also like to say as to the anguish, is that there are several kinds of anguishes in, 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 in this operation. Even though I was very lucky, um, I left Cuba, I was asked at the time whether I had any preferences to where to go, I decided that being a Cuban with a Cuban mentality in which the capital has it's a marked contrast with the rest of the cities. I said, I want to go to the capital. And they said, to Washington, D.C.? Mm -hmm. I said, yes. Mm -hmm. So I ended up in Washington, D.C. Um, I didn't mm -hmm. think of New York or Chicago or Los Angeles or anything. So even though I ended up at a university here, at a dormitory, I didn't go through a terrible foster parents or orphanages or anything, the, my anguish, and I was, you know, st studying, it was an adventure, it was a very wonderful moment in my life. Nevertheless, my family was in Cuba. So I was very concerned about what was going to happen to them. And I particularly remember, and I think René, who's here, was my classmate at the time, I remember on October of 1962, at that social center of the university, watching the missile crisis. And I said, oh my God, you know, uh, me, I'm in Washington, D.C., certainly a target, and my mother is in Havana, another target. So, you know, we both are going to be blown up, or well, certainly one of us. So the anguish, and another type of anguish, um, as time went by, the letters I would be getting from Cuba would become nonsensical. I would not understand the language. I didn't know what was going on. I and mean, you know, my mother would say, tu hermana está marcando en la oficoda. 
You know, I have no idea what the marcara of Ficoda, I mean, the language, the, the, so the anxiety of saying, what, what are they doing? What are they saying? So I ended up watching uh, Soviet movies in the theater so that I could at least tell them to go to see something because I couldn't tell them to go to see The Sound of Music because they would never see that. <laughs> so I would remember going to see The Adventures of Tsar Saltan, which was a, a, a rollo, but at least I could share something with them. So it's a, my experience is a little different, but, but the fact that I felt that I was being disconnected by the minute of their experiences, uh, because you know we, had, we lived in two different planets. And then going back to how this plan was formulated and how all this came about, what role did the CIA play in all of this? Well, we don't quite know because uh, there's no smoking gun. Okay, what we do know is that the Cuba project, like it or not, was in, the CIA was in charge of the Cuba project. Um, it is in a State Department indexing system early in 1960, not December or January, that there is an entry for unaccompanied minors from this particular part of, um, of Latin America. So it, it, this, it comes a little earlier than parents, you know, I think all this feeds into it. I mean, I think when we study immigration generally, we need to understand what's going on in the place, what's going on in the place they're coming to, because mm -hmm. it's a very complicated global transnational movement of policies on, on many, many ends. Um, the, in, in April, like I said, there was only less than 700 minors had come by April of April 17th. It was initially thought of as a very small program. I don't think anybody had in mind anywhere that this thing was going to mushroom to the way that it did. Um, so I think that, that, that it's very contained. Um, there are questions between April and October of the missile crisis, and again, I do question U.S. policy as well as Cuban mm -hmm. policy. Uh, because it was the United States that shut the doors. And there is a huge paper trail all over the, the Johnson administration where the children themselves are asking Senator Paul Douglas to bring their children out, <coughs> asking the UN. The UN offers to pay for the flights of the parents, to negotiate their exit, and the United States responds by saying no. And I think that we, we need to figure out, I guess, a more balanced perspective to understand all the forces that were at play. At that point, there were 8,000 children waiting to be reunited. But this one, the missile crisis? Well, missile crisis is 62. We're talking all the way to 65. There's three years there where there is what Trump's children's needs, because there is a perspective, I think, that children are resilient and can do that. But in reality, at least psychological literature tells you, the younger you are, the deeper the trauma is. Yeah. And yeah, so sure. it, children, we have this idea that they're resilient. And it's, it's hard to go back to the 1960s because, I mean, Dr. Spock wrote his book, what, in the early 60s. So we know a lot more about children's emotional needs today than we did then. Well, but, and, and, and countries have an obligation to protect the right to family life. So, right. you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's part of the obligation towards those children to enable them to reunify with parents. So it is, I think, surprising to think that this wasn't considered right. part of the obligations to this, to this section to the of the children. population. To and, the children. and to the parents who entrusted their children to the U.S. government. When you because say, in that case, I mean, for instance, the children I came with, their father ended up in jail. He was part of Grau's group. He ended up in jail for 20 years working with the CIA. <laughs> he entrusted his children to his handlers. And his children were abused. And at the time that his wife tried to come, they would not let her into the United States. So again, the stories are complicated. They're wrapped around policy. They're wrapped around you know, an immediate situation that includes both things going on in Cuba and things going on here in the United but States. Media. I just had a point of clarification. I thought that in December of 1962, regardless of what the U.S. did, I also thought that the Cuban government had closed the doors to emigration. That's my recollection. No, they're going to Spain. People are still going to Spain. Between 62 okay. and 65? Yeah. There's a whole program of people going to Spain, and in fact, what happens is those Cubans are trying to come into the United States that are going to Spain, 
and the United States tries to count them against the Western European quota, mm -hmm. and Spain says, uh-uh-uh, you count Spanish, not Cubans. So there's a whole, um, the, the door, what happened is that Cuba would not let, there were children who tried to go back, and Cuba said no. Do you think Operation Pedro Pan contributed to the long-standing controversy uh, surrounding our travel restrictions to Cuba? Well, I think it contributed to Cuba's policies of not letting children travel, okay, which they do restrict. Uh, even writers and poets who visit have to get super, 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 super special permission if they're going to travel with children. Um, I think that the travel, um, you mean from Cubans, Americans going to Cuba? Both and, ways, yeah. You know, I don't think it's just Pedro Pan. There was 300,000 Cubans who were here with other visas. Um, I say we came in with visa waivers. We came in with funny papers. I mean, we came in with papers signed by International Rescue Committee, you know, uh, by a priest, you know, in the middle of the Cold War, anti-Catholicism in the United States. Uh, it is, I think that contributes to the Cuban Adjustment Act because at some point, two presidents, Kennedy and Johnson, had to parole us through executive power because Congress did not want to do it. And indeed, in Miami, People, once they figured out that we were there to stay, they said, wait a minute, get them out of here. Okay, so I think that contributes to the relocation program. In fact, when, when Pedro Pan's parents came, they were not allowed to bring their children to Miami. They had to go out to where their children were at a certain point. Not all the time. No, no, not all, the, no, not at, at a certain point in about 63, 64, um, um, or I mean in 65, I'm sorry, when parents come, the children that are in different places, they don't transport them to Miami. They're making, that's why we have Cuban communities in Dubuque, Iowa, in, in, you know, parents wanted to stay in Miami with their relatives. And local officials there were resistant to having the concentration of Cubans. What do you think of America's uh, travel policy right now to Cuba, this administration's policy? Well, I personally think it's, uh, it's a um, violation of U.S citizens right to travel um, which is made more um, um, strikingly um, glaring you know the the contrast between allowing cuban americans to a large degree to travel and none other americans i think that as an american citizen i think that i have the right to travel everywhere and i think that that should be such an important right that only in with the highest i mean it has to be approached in a way that you limit it only when, when the highest degree of danger to you or to the policy of your country. So at this point, maybe at some point you would say, you know, um, there is a, I mean, there's a tsunami in Japan, you, you ask people not to go, but denying the right to travel of an American citizen, I think that's preposterous. I think it's, a, it's an unconstitutional thing to do. What do you think, Luis? Well, um, I'm not privileged to why, the reasons why the United States makes those decisions. So um, I know that they have to think about their uh, uh, national security and politics and all that. And so uh, I have no desire to go to Cuba while the communist regime is still there. Okay. So uh, I just base my feelings on that. All right. And Nana? I am with Emilio. I think travel should be important. I think engagement is important. Um, I think that um, the more that not only Americans but Cubans realize that there's many Cubans in Cuba who think exactly like we do, okay? Um, it brings down the tension and it actually, I'm, I'm convinced that it's Fidel who doesn't want us there. Uh, because every time in the last 50 years that it looked like the United States was about to normalize one aspect or another, Fidel did something calculated to make sure that it didn't happen. So at least for those who advocate the policy of no engagement, I would suggest look at who's really um, benefiting in a certain sense from that policy. Lucy, you mentioned uh, Senator Mel Martinez as yes. one of the success stories of Bishop. Yes. Who are some of the other well-known 